Let me introduce our regional feature. Ian Cognito is a writer from Yellow Point. Uh, he is the founder and artistic director of uh, uh, 15 Minutes of Infamy. Actually, um, I think he is the former artistic director, but I'm going to let him clarify that. A WordCraft cabaret in Nanaimo. And uh, he's also involved with WordStorm Society of the Arts. Um, he has published a collection of poetry entitled Flora, Fauna, and H. Sapiens with co-author Pat Smikal and is currently, uh, he has already uh, put the finishing touches on Anna Musings, a bestiary of poetic reflection. And he is, uh, he has founded a wonderful uh, small press called Repartee Press. It's almost a, a very cool sort of a, a project oriented um, press and maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about that. And his other incarnations have included language instructor, a child and youth care worker, and an education assistant and theatrical clown in no particular order. So um, welcome, Ian. We are so grateful to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, that, that looks like a, a yes. Uh, I won't get into the all the, oops, I wanna to go to gallery view. I'm gonna scare myself, just a sec. Okay, um, I won't go into a, a lengthy explanation of how it took me so long to get back here after I got shot out again. But um, anyhow, um, there is something I should explain so you can understand. I am a gay writer, a queer auteur, a sissy boy wonder pondering and pontificating with an effete sensibility. Ever seen a drag show before? Not exactly subtle, is it? And nor am I, my darlings, nor am I. I might have a bit of trouble walking on heels, but I can sure as hell have some fun doing it. Adjectives and adverbs and puffed up nouns are my eyeshadow, my mascara, and my shimmering lip gloss, a boy girl's best friends. Hyperbole and tired metaphors are my sequins, my gold lame, and yes, my tiara the crowning accessory atop my impossibly big hair. I may not be classy, but I am beautiful in my own sweet, trashy way. That was, that poem is entitled Dharma Queen. Uh, I wrote it to explain my writing style a bit or perhaps excuse it. Um, I also like to refer to myself as a discursive hyperbolist in verse. Uh, uh, this next poem is a pandemic poem. I didn't think I would write a pandemic poem because I didn't want to write anything too angsty or listless. Um, but I have so far written four. And this one I wrote just this week at the suggestion of uh, Lily Brown. And uh, just to make it accessible to everybody, does everyone know what a Corvid is? Corvid is the... Um, is the crow, raven, blue jay family of birds. And does everyone, does everyone know what you call a, a group of crows together? Yes, murder, right? Okay, so this is called As the Crow Flails. The COVID-20 flu virus contracted from crows, ravens, magpies, or jays has begun to circulate around the globe and to compete openly with the COVID-19 virus. Also referred to as the trickster virus by First Nations and bird watchers of any merit, COVID-20 causes the infected to have an overpowering desire to steal shiny things and to shit on passers-by from treetops. People stricken with this virus also develop a tendency to caw, cluck, or warble as the occasion demands, and to hop out of the way nonchalantly at the last possible second. Some will even stretch their wings to simulate flight, though feathers are still forthcoming, perhaps with future mutations. Compared to bat-vectored and agriculturally induced contagions, COVID-20 is a relatively mild ailment inflicting its victims with an assortment of eccentricities that might be considered charming inflated creatures, 
but which can be seen as annoying by bipedal creatures of a humanoid, humanoid persuasion. There is no known cure for the COVID-20 virus. It has a tenacious presence that resists all known intervention protocols. Indeed, clusters of the inflicted can lead to murders of a most benign variety. Okay, so now I'm going to pull out Anna Musings and uh, I'll read a few, few selections from this and I, I won't go into uh, lengthy explanations uh, about any of the poems before I read them, uh, except to, to maybe highlight the sections of the book from which in which they appear. So this first one is called Acculturating to Vulture and the section in which it appears is entitled Animenter's Beauty in the Beast. Yeah, vultures are ugly. Their heads look like feet turned inside out without the socks. Know what I'm saying? And their food choices, nothing short of putrid. Liking it ripe would be an understatement for a vulture. Oh yeah, they're definitely on the ugly side. Like hyenas, those other scavengers whose rapacious faces even a mother couldn't. But vultures play a vital role. They're key stoners, nature's garbage men, some would say. And if you've ever seen them fly, well, you'd suspend all judgment right then and there as they circle overhead on a scent quest, gliding on six foot wingspans, barely flapping as they navigate on thermal currents making this air ballet of theirs appear effortless and serene. Any thought then of their inherent unattractiveness, banished upon witnessing this mesmerizing display of ugliness made whole. This next poem or this next group of poems comes from a section entitled Animals Are Us. And this first one entitled Defeat of the Beast Domestication is actually a very old poem, which I have hammered into shape for this collection. Defeat of the Beast. Some tasks in this world are difficult to take. Shaving would be one of them. Facial traces of the beast are whisked away to varying degrees using various methods. Blade draggled across the face to <laughs> blade draggled across the face to yield a barren stubble plain. Big bushy things manicured with the panache of a topiarist. Whiskers trimmed and quaffed, wax combed or styled into nice civilized clumps. Permitted outcroppings that avow each person's stratagem for chastening the beast. Elective baldness in all its permutations. Beast buckles and retreats as cutting edge and scissor snip launch their offensive to beat off his savage and woolly advance. I like, I, I saw I got a little snap in there. I like the snaps. Uh, this one is called Infinite Relations. Ikaria Wariusha. Let's say it again. Ikaria Wariusha. Don't you love the sound of that? A sea worm which lived 555 million years ago. Common ancestor to fish, amphibians, reptiles, various invertebrates, and yes, humans. Bilaterians like us. Though I regret to say sponges, coral, sea stars, and jellyfish are not part of the family. Called bilaterians like us, due to a symmetrical back and front, equipped with a mouth, anus, and a gut in between, in one end and out the other, a process that's been going down for an awfully long time. Sorry, Lucy, you'll have to step aside, relinquish your exalted position at the pinnacle. We have a great, 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 blah, blah, blah ancestor who makes your unearthing pale by comparison a six millimeter sea worm uniting most of God's creatures as brethren. There was no immaculate evolution, not by an ultra long shot. 
this one uh, came to be after I, after talking to my friend Carolyn on the phone, and she's uh, quite a cat fanatic. And she was really looking forward to the Cats movie, which uh, after the fact has been pretty universally panned. But this was written before then. It's called Ramataz Jazz Cat Cut Quick. Inspired by the soon to be released Cats movie, Carolyn attempts a stretch, a graceful stretch, cat-like in conception and execution. The full-on kind of cat stretch that zippers from tip to tip in one undulating ripple. It starts in her soft forepaws, shifts up through her limbs, quivers across her shoulders, arches up through fluffy abdomen and along her supple spine, producing cat-inspired calligraphy in movement. The perfect W with a flick of tail as the final flourish. Ah, but somewhere in the process, she pulls a muscle just below her armpit, teres major, cramps up due to the most human-like of spasms, unmistakable, cutting through this illusion in one wincing jolt. She had hoped to ride the wave a little longer, to slink kitty-like into a leisurely gambol, or to curl in upon herself in cat-like repose. But instead, she has revealed she's no kitten after all, nor a properly warmed up dancer with feline pretensions. Uh, this one comes from a section that is entitled Birdie Words. And it's called Specialized Delivery. And this is actually something that I witnessed in nature that I did not know about before. And some of you may not know either. On this rare wintry day for coastal BC, what us expats from back east would call the real thing, the pond has frozen over completely. Icy surface fissured by rust colored veins, its opaline face mottled with concentric rings of white, gray, and ochre. Sparrows on the pond have adopted, adapted beautifully to the change in weather stealing this opportunity to profit from a new arrangement. From a starting point on the ice, they fly straight up and hover just even with the tip of a reed or rush long enough to bend its stalk downward in an arc and to let it go so it can spring back up forcefully. They descend straight away to a place on the ice where seeds have fallen thanks to this makeshift catapult of theirs, and they chow down on freshly harvested grains by the many. Now, who is it postulated the ability to improvise tools and to use them adroitly is the exclusive domain of humans and simians? And what would an ant or a bumblebee or a bird have to say about such a conceit. Okay, and this one is from a section entitled Plantimals. A colleague of mine uh, suggested to me that she thought a poet would be able to write about almost anything, including the ugliness of a sunset or the ugliness of an orchid. So um, I wasn't quite up to looking at the ugliness of a sunset, so I decided to focus on an orchid. This is called Rorschach Corsage. If the words ugly and garish were directly synonymous, an orchid could truly be found to be ugly. What with its vulgar curves, its distended flanges, those tendrils winding out and downward, that shameless display of genitalia in heat, and the makeup applied liberally, emphatically, as if by a drag queen on LSD. The words, get over here, fuck me now, scrawled across its puckered face, enticements to fly by pollinators amid promises of a staying power unrivaled in less ostentatious species. Of course, there are more subtle varieties within the Orchidaceae family, but even they cannot refrain from proclaiming their orchidness, the ugliness inherent in their rococo appeal. They do it on a smaller scale is all, displaying the relativity of what may be considered tasteful 
by dissing their very own cousins for their boldness and flamboyance, betraying the whole family with a dialed down aesthetic. And that is without a doubt an ugly thing to do. I feel like after a lot of my poems, I should be going Okay, here we go. This one is from a section called Imposition of Glass. And the poem is called Imposition of Glass. And the first line was borrowed from Andrew Brown. Can glass be trusted to let every detail pass through, each subtlety in shape, each hue? Can it be trusted to let the sun's morning grace pour in unadulterated to perform its magic trick of lifting, of lifting goosebumps from the skin? Can glass, this intermediary, be trusted not to shatter into infinite pieces in one swift torrent, exposing the whole world out there as it floods on through in all its rawness and its beauty? Who could endure such a thing? And this one is called Vocal, e Vocal Over Easy. Oops, what did I do? Just a sec, my computer just did a number. Oh, shoot. Oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> um, Okay, this one is called Vocal Over Easy, and it has a guest appearance by a, a quite a famous singer in it. Uh, we have a, a beaver pond behind our house, and this one is a, um, an auditory, um, I would say an auditory observation, if there can be such a thing. Vocal Over Easy. Bullfrog on our pond croaks its territorial call, joins in a duet with Julie London as she spins on the player. The, the two of them go one on one, perform their version of, I've got it bad and that ain't good. Miss London, her voice used and worked over by years of smoking, drinking, and singing, singing, croons in her lower register, occasionally dropping down to the bullfrog's best note. The frog, in turn, chimes in with a harmony here and there, tossed out in an unsophisticated rhythm, a very loose 4-4. Four, four. Here is a surprising pairing, one which manages to work on some level. The consensus holds, however, Ms. London has the better pitch and altogether way more style. Any Julie London fans out there? <laughs> okay, um, and this one is another observation through the window, but I, I, I placed it out, outside, but I actually did see this through the window. It's called a thousand to one. A sudden gust sends maple keys, thousands of them, whirly birding down around us in a flurry of wondrous precipitation. Nature delights again, is at her aerodynamic best, with yet another of her cast of thousands pageants. A lone dragonfly floats among the cascading keys, almost indistinguishable. He would be lost to the eye were it not for his hovering presence there within the twirling surge. And then, sure enough, he takes off, zooms on oscillating wings along a vertical arc in one singular act of distinction. And I think I'll let you go with one last one. Um, I realized that uh, with the zombie culture that's going on currently, um, you know, we have, of course, we have the zombie movies and the zombie t show, t TV shows. Um, I even, uh, G uh, is it Jane Austen has been reinvented with various zombie stories as well. So I realized I didn't have a zombie poem. And I thought, well, what would a zombie be in a poem? What would you want to be killing off? So this poem is, in call, is entitled Abomination Buster. Here is my zombie poem. Hey, I'm no pop cultural, I'll start again. Here is my zombie poem. Hey, I'm no pop culture pariah. That was hard to say. A poem chock full of 
dead metaphors and comatose cliches. Their woe be gone listless corpses crawling as we speak from within a repository of useless dead stuff. A fetid mass of decomposition in the graveyard of failed potential. They roam at night, these zombies, when our guard is down, when we are at our most vulnerable. Their lifeless eyes opaque, unseeing, yet ablaze with flesh lust, a hunger for blood and guts and gooey things, for any hapless chump killing time on the fringes of a stanza. The walking dead attack voraciously, tenaciously, yet with precision, despite their awkward zombie gait and obvious demeanor. And so we must assail them in equal measure with savagery and determination, dismember them, decapitate them, spare no amount of blood, slime, or viscera in our slugfest sluggard slaughter, we cannot allow them to have their way with our poetry, their gaping mouths oozing with the blood and sinew of our best new efforts. Kill them, kill them, brutally, mercilessly, and as graphically as you can. So uh, I, I realize I committed the sin that I'm uh, decrying in that one, but <laughs> please understand that was deliberate. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. It was very hard getting here. <laughs> if we appreciate every single effort. It was just, you wouldn't believe the amount of troubleshooting that got packed into that 20 minutes that you weren't seeing me. Finally, I figured out because it was, it kept telling me that I have this program, this file sharing program called sync.com and it kept mentioning sync.com. So I thought, okay, why don't I just, uh, uh, delete that program and I did and then everything worked again. Oh my goodness. Yes, well, so obviously Zoom and sync.com do not like each other. No. Thank you so much for making the effort repeatedly the, the what we suffer for our art. This is all <laughs> I can think of here. And yeah. we've got some nice <coughs> comments there in and my dog has just barked to demonstrate her approval. Oh so I didn't see the comments. <coughs> 